the hole in my dream. And you're circling the bottom of the hole in my drum And the clock just gets easier to run down Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to State of Sound Stories. I'm Jason Evans-Growth. We're here inaugurating the corner on Centennial Campus at NC State University, or at NC State University, looking at NC State University libraries where State of Sound was birthed and continues to live. Um, and we're very excited to, for this inaugural event, have our friend Libby Rodenbow uh, to tell stories uh, about music, about life. We're gonna get into that in a second. Thank you so much for being here, Libby. It's a pleasure and an honor to inaugurate this space. It's pretty nice today. For those of you who are listening, uh, it's 79 degrees here in beautiful Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, the sun is beating down on your left arm. That's right. Uh, which is covered with cool, dry, sport sunscreen, which we believe was purchased three to four years ago at the former Kroger here in Raleigh, North Carolina. And thank you to Neutrogena for sponsoring this series. Yeah, we just made another $1,000 <laughs> by just mentioning them. It feels good. As a reminder, uh, State of Sound is a project that we started here at the libraries um, on a whim about eight years ago in Hunt Library when I was talking to a group of digital audio workstation songwriting students about how I wanted to start a record label through the libraries. How I felt like we had the resources to help people make things and share things music and art related wise that could maybe overlap with the work that they do at school, whether that's textiles or engineering or whatever. And then I kept talking about it and eventually we got a budget for it. So um, State of Sound Stories is our chance to interact with artists and talk about what it takes or what it took or what it continues to maybe take in the future to have a life that involves sound and in, in today's case music. Um, whether that is the only thing that you do, whether it is a part of your life that enhances everything else. So we're really excited to talk to you about it because Libby, you make a lot of music. I do, yeah. It's what I spend most of my time doing. It is what I, it is what I, uh, how I make my living, but it's all, there's also a lot of music that I do outside of the um, more lucrative parts of that business because I believe in it and it enriches my life, like you were saying. So I happen to be in a band that pays my bills called Mipso but then I do it enables me to do a lot of other things on the side that don't necessarily make money and those a lot of that stuff is I mean I'm interested in that kind of music making being accessible to everybody when did you uh, as far as your story goes when did it become clear that music was going to be or was such a huge part of your life something that was compelling you to make more of it or even to get better at it or, or, or start your own? Well, I, th my path is probably different from a lot of people's and sometimes I feel like I'm, I mean, this is cliche, but I do have a little of the classic imposter syndrome because I didn't grow up saying that I was gonna be a musician. I was a really mediocre classical violin student and um, I, when I got to college, I had some friends who started a band and they were like, we're doing this kind of bluegrassy thing and we know you play classical violin, but can you kind of fake your way through some bluegrass licks? And so that's how I started doing it. And that band was, they were called Mipso Trio at the time, but they, that ended up being like a real band over years of hard work. And then when we graduated, we just decided to try to do it full time. And I don't think we had any inkling that we would, would be able to do it for, now it's been like 10 years. So I kind of stumbled into it um, sideways. Now that I do it, it feels like, I guess it feels like what I was meant to do at some level, but I feel, I'm, I'm very interested in how we can make that type of path more obvious to people like me, because even though I ended up in it, it was sort of just circumstance that made that happen. And I, I think I was telling you before the podcast, I did not, have any idea that there were like middle class musicians. Growing up, I thought there were like celebrities who played, you know, Bonnaroo and stuff. And then there were local musicians who played exclusively at like coffee shop open mics. And I had no idea about the like large swath of middle class musicians, I'll call them, the class that I'm a part of now, I would say, who, you know, 
make a little money doing it and work hard and kind of slog through it and there's never like a big break moment but you just do it as your work and you intend to do it for your lifetime if you can. When you were a, uh, and I, I mean, I have trouble believing you were a totally mediocre classical violin student. You can ask you have, my, my teacher. You have claimed this to me before. You've claimed it to me on State of Sound sessions in the past, and, and uh, since my voice was never part of that, you couldn't hear me arguing. But um, <laughs> was that the path? Was like the classical violin, was that going to be the job? Were you going to be an orchestra? Was that how you were going to get paid? Uh, I mean, I went into my freshman year at UNC trying to do classical music, and I quickly realized, I mean, UNC is not like the most elite classical music program in the world, and there's only uh, so many symphony orchestras in the world that exist that still can like pay somebody's living. So I think I learned pretty quickly that I was not even in like the, <laughs> the, the broader echelon that includes the higher echelon of people who make a living playing classical music. Um, but then I was kind of like, well, then what do I do with this? I spent these 14 years kind of like slogging through learning how to play the violin, and I felt sort of sad about it, but I didn't know what else you could do with music, so I was like, I guess that's it. I'm, I'm hanging up the bow. So did it take being like that middle class musician that you're talking about, was your first thing, did you first encounter that when you became part of that scene? Or were you seeing inklings of it before that happened? No, I, I didn't know. I didn't really know what like playing a gig was. I didn't know if you made, I didn't know if it was possible to make any money at all playing a gig. And oftentimes it's not, but um, I didn't, I really didn't have any idea. And I will say I was spoiled because my bandmates at MIPSO were much more business minded than me. I was kind of just showing up with a violin and they were doing all the like contract negotiations and stuff and they were really savvy. They decided, we were all Moorhead Kane scholars at UNC, so we had our tuition paid for, and we were kind of living a cush life. I didn't, I didn't realize how cush it was until I graduated. But um, we did not use any of the money that we made playing music for like all the years we were in college. We saved it up so that we could make our first album. So that was, I, I don't know, that was their thinking, not mine, but it turned out to be like a really brilliant move. And then we've kept it, we've tried to like do it in a real economical way where we always paid ourselves a salary rather than like paying out at the end of a tour. So we would try, at first it was a really small, so we used to make 700 bucks a month and like we inched our way up to something that was more sustainable. But we just tried to think of it as like a long-term plan even when we weren't sure if that was gonna work. And I don't know, maybe it was one of those things where you just, you, you manifest it by acting like it could really happen. Well, I think that's a real, um, what you just said is super important. Just sometimes playing a gig is a matter of making the gig up yourself, right? Like sometimes mm -hmm. if you don't, um, and, man, and, and that's a form of manifestation, you know, deciding to be in a band, deciding to, to play in front of people takes guts and you have to manifest your way into doing that. And, th and that does translate, I feel like, in, in, in professional music um, in, in terms of like, we're going we're gonna to get paid. We're going to do this and we're going to pay ourselves, even if it's just $175 a week. Like, but that's uh, this legitimizing thing and um, that we, I, th I feel like we live in a, a, an artistic culture that delegitimizes anything sometimes but classical music. Sometimes people, you know, who, or people who teach music. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, I think for a lot of people, or people who, for example, at NC State who maybe are only music minors, because that's what we have here, they don't necessarily see a path to that $175 a week because it feels like a hobby necessarily, you know? It, it feels like uh, something that you can't break through because our standards are so high. So it's cool to hear that you just made that plan to have like what would be a, you know, a part-time job. I remember uh, a, a rock and roll person who I admired when I was in college in bands told me that what I was looking forward to if I wanted to be a musician was making about what I would make if I started at McDonald's. And I was like, well, yeah, but I get to play music. Like, right. you know, like I that mean, seems cool. Right, I mean, that's important context, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, talking about music is awesome and we're gonna continue to do it, but listening to music is great too. You have a guitar with you, which is not a violin. That's true. Um, uh, when did, was this something that you learned concurrently and would you be willing to show us how it works and sing along with it so that you can demonstrate what music is? Sure. Well, this is the people's instrument, and I'm also mediocre at it, but I think it matters less if you're mediocre at guitar. I, this is just a vessel for me to write songs on. I do write songs on the violin sometimes, but it's difficult because it's hard to sing and play at the same time. 
So I'll start with a song. I just finished recording a second um, solo album. And I'm going to sing a song. I wanted to mention that when I was talking about how we made it work or whatever, there was some important context that I left out, which is that all of us have wealthy parents. And I think that like 95% of career musicians have wealthy parents. And it's worth, that's worth stating. And I think that's um, not cool. And we are, are, the whole artistic landscape hurts for that because we are basically hearing one type of perspective on the world um, most of the time. So this is a song about um, real hopes that I have on my good days about the world looking really different one day. And it started out of um, conversations with my dad, conversations verging on arguments about Bernie Sanders. You can call me names, you can say that I am stuck in my ways. You can see what you want, that's your prerogative. We are only here to take it in and make our best. Maybe you will be the one who does it best. But if it all goes south, there will be dancing down there. Cause I know that I'm not the only one who needs another world. Everybody knows it. It's too bad what we've come to But we get our edges scratched Except the one you know The one, the one between the blades You can feel what you want That's your prerogative It's just that every time I pick up my camera It says What are you gonna do? Take a new kind of picture Say a new prayer for the world Get blood from a stone Tell a new kind of joke Everybody knows it's too bad What we've come to But we get our itches scratched Except the one you know The one, the one between the blades Maybe you will be the one who reaches that But if it all goes south There will be dancing down there Cause I know that I'm not the only one who needs another world I know that I'm not the only one who needs another world I know that I'm not the only one who needs another world I know that I'm not the only one who needs another world I know that I'm not the only one who needs another world I know I'm not the only one who needs another world Thank you. We're here with Libby Rodenbow at the corner on Centennial Campus. That was beautiful. That's from the new, that's from the upcoming record? An upcoming record, indeed, yeah. Cool. Um, I, I'm, uh, I couldn't stop thinking about what you just said about um, artists emerging from wealth. I think about that a lot when it comes uh, to people I've worked with, too, to small businesses. I think a lot of times people forget that that is a way that investment in art begins and has been for thousands mm -hmm. of years. Mm -hmm. um, has that tension always been a part of you now that you've been in, like thinking about, it, it feels like you're expressing that tension through music right now, but um, how does that play out in your artistic life? I wish that it played out in, I wish that I was involved in more things that I felt were attacking that problem. So far, most of the way that it plays out is it's just something I think about and it's something I try to talk about. I mean, I do think that's a first step. I think that there's, you know, a hundred 
inter music interviews with indie rock bands a minute, and very rarely do any of them say like, oh yeah, the reason that I can live this like slum in it kind of lifestyle is because there's very little actual risk to me. Like I'm not actually, you know, gonna end up on the street one day and I'm not, there's no, I don't have like elderly parents depending on me for income after they can't work anymore. You know, things like this. I think are just rarely considerations for people who are making music professionally because it's such a precarious way of life. And I think that that's not exclusive to music, that's just you know where I'm situated most of the time. But if we had a world where everybody had healthcare and everybody had access to stable housing and stuff like that, then people could do music more freely, people could do everything more freely. and people would be thinking about their lives in a totally different way. And it's a beautiful vision that I don't think is so far out of reach, although on some days it feels very far out of reach. I thought it was, um, it was eye-opening for me the first time any of my bands toured in Europe, and I know you've spent time in Europe too, to meet opening bands who's, who were getting paid by the government to be in a band mm -hmm. and, to, uh, and who were surprised at us even mentioning what it was like to struggle with, A, the legitimacy of being an independent musician. I mean, my parents didn't, hey mom and dad, my parents <laughs> would, ta would call my years of touring vacation. I'd be on the road for nine months <laughs> yeah. and they thought I was out like just having fun. I was having a good time because I was doing work that I liked. And I think it is fun and that's why we, we want work that's fun, right? Like that's the, the, the point, but like I couldn't, it's, it's never quite scaled for me. And it, like as a librarian here at State and a person who works in media, um, trying to let people know that uh, it does feel like we're clawing to get to some place that we like um, because we've been told it's illegitimate this whole, or, or, or a hobby or something like that this whole mm -hmm. time. Um, is there, is it just talking about it that will help people A, feel like they can be a part of it and B, start to attack, like, address those problems? Like, can we do anything about that? I think that um, like all the horrible, kind of insurmountable structural things <laughs> that are wrong with the world, there's not a ton we can do, but I think there are things that we can do if we, if we focus our energy on like the local level of things. I think like there's a lot of local arts councils that gave out grant funding with fewer restrictions during the pandemic. And I know a lot of musicians that that was really useful for. They were able to, even if they had to find other work, it gave them a little like padding so that they felt they could still continue working on music during the pandemic. There's things like that where I, I think that like there is, and like what you're doing right now with this series, this, this, I'm getting paid to do this series and it's gonna be very helpful for me. I don't, I don't really make enough money, you know, but I'm not, I'm not complaining about that. I'm just like, I think it's, I'm expressing that even for a person like me who does come from a privileged background and I have a dad to fall back on if I needed to, it sucks that I don't make enough money even though I work all the time. And so the fact that NC State has some funding that they can give out to musicians, that's a wonderful thing. I think a lot of universities have money, like you're saying, that they wonder how to spend it. They wonder how to engage more with the local community. And this is a great way to do that. I think, I think people are becoming more aware of that. I think people are becoming less squeamish about the idea of giving money directly to people, which is a good thing. <laughs> like historically that's been, I, I'm on the board of the North Carolina Arts Council. And so I deal with a lot of grant funding over there. And it's like, one of the things we talk about I'm sure you've talked about this in the library system too, is that grants are really inaccessible to a lot of people because they don't have a background in like filling out paperwork. And it's kind of obvious that the type of people who are gonna hear about grants and apply for them are people who already know what a grant is and understand how to like do a short answer question that's intended for a government bureaucrat. And that's a really small subset of the population. So I, I think at the North Carolina Arts Council, I hope this is true other places, people are waking up to that and realizing that we need to be, I guess that we need to trust people more and that we can just give money directly to people. And you know, you don't always have to see a, an exact return on your money. You can just, you can trust that people who are making art and, and need money to do that are gonna use it in the best way they know how. I am. Um that return on investment um, 
is such an interesting concept for I think people who are struggling to consider getting into making art at all and sharing it. Like we don't know what our ROI is supposed to be when we yeah. write our first song. Like, do we write our song? Is, is the song for a significant other we're trying to woo? And is it good if they like us? Is it for our? Is it is it so we can get a record label to sign us? And then you know, like, and and it's it's this, I think. One of the reasons we do this series is to talk about how people who are established also feel, had, have gotten to the point where we feel like we do it because we know it matters. We've, we, we, we know it matters in ways that we can't quantify necessarily. Mm -hmm. It's a feeling about it mattering. Um, when we see it in, in terms of getting paid, but we don't get paid a lot, and in terms of selling records, but we probably don't sell that many, and um, when when you were when when Mipso is beginning and when you're starting to play more, like was there a moment? Was it even before that where where it broke in you and you realized that it just mattered to do it? Like just deciding to do it mattered. Well, I think you get little glimpses of that almost every time you play a show. And we've played a sh we've played shows to much fewer people than are here today. Um, I'm I, I can see about like eight people who are making eye contact with the stage. And I've played, I've played to smaller shows than that. But afterward, if you have a conversation with somebody who connects with it at all, then it, the, I mean, honestly, that's enough to justify the trip right there. That's very meaningful to me. And I, when I read a book that both me and my bandmate and Mipso, it really helped us to kind of situate the importance of what we're doing and to make it less about ego and more sort of about like, I guess just sort of the the ethical burden of being alive. And it's this book by Lewis Hyde. Um, uh, I'm forgetting the title, but something like The Erotic Life of Gifts. And it's about how there's a kind of alternative way of thinking about value in the world to you know capitalism or whatever you want to call the way that we value evaluate things these days. And he talks about art as a gift. And I think most people who make art feel that way, that it's there's something they're channeling. You hear people use that language all the time. And it is meaningful to channel something and give it away and have someone else receive it. And it's that is worthwhile in itself. And so it's like a, I'm tr it's, it's good, I think, to search for a language that is not the language of investment capitalism. And I, that's what I'm looking for in my own journey at you know making music but that book really helped me a lot um i wish i could remember the exact title right now but lewis hyde something like the erotic life of gifts the cool thing about post-production is that i'm just gonna Im impersonate your voice Perfect. or find all the right words to put that together and we'll get that title let's Perfect. do a yeah let's do a deep fake yeah <laughs> you can just great. you can just have me recommend whatever book you want <laughs> sounds good we're right outside of the library it's perfect um your your fingers are betraying the uh, th the fact that you probably want to play some more music right now. So let's hear something else. Let's Is that okay? Yeah, let's do it. Great. I wish I had a song about the erotic life of gifts, but I'll just play another song um, from my new album. This is called Easier to Run, and it's kind of a it's a it's a sort of a heartbreak song, but it's also about um, getting older and feeling distance from. Um, emotional experiences that were once extreme. <laughs> Coming or going, the water's fine. I can see your sweat rolling down. Swimming or drowning, I know it's a draw from the shore And now I feel the cool of the clouds So I open my mouth and I choke on my tongue And another season's gone And you're circling the bottom of the hole in my drum And the clock just gets easier to run down I'm a sensible engine I'm a wilting machine You're beautiful Broken down, down 
And I can hear the answers, but they only talk to me. And I fear the way they pull on my hand. So I open my eyes, and I'm stuck on the sun, and another season's gone. And you're circling the bottom of the hole in my drum And the clock just gets easier to run down Ooh. Well, I'd go to Louisiana if I could stand the sticky sheets I would go to the city if I was young I'd sail across the ocean If I could bear to rock and roll But I'm earthbound the way that I'm strung So I open my mouth And I choke on my tongue And another season's gone And you're circling the bottom of the hole In my drum and the clock just gets easier to run down It's State of Sound Stories. We're here with Libby Rodenbo. Uh, beautiful. Also, um, the birds were harmonizing in a very delightful way during that. See, that's how you know somebody's giving me this song. Yeah. Thank you, universe. Yeah, thanks, universe. Um, I just heard an interesting phrase the other day um, that I believe, without going too much into it, uh, Stephen King wrote, which is something like, talent won't shut up. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that talent means that you're an expert or good even at it, but people can be talented and feel that they have to do things in order to let that talent speak. Um, I feel so, so much that like, uh, like squashing that in some way um, is just something that we're, we, we learn to do, whether that's by going sometimes for people who want to go to music school and they feel like they're it's political like music becomes political for them mm -hmm. or they have to show off how many tracks they can put up on SoundCloud in a week or whatever when really all they um, in a lot of ways just letting it speak in some way finding that way for it to come out um, is just Im is imperative state of sound imperatives uh, to just f having general well-being about the path that you choose so um, do you feel that uh, like, how has that changed in your career in, in music? Like, how has that imperative changed? Um, whether that's ego, like losing the ego a little bit or learning new skills or playing with more people, or what, what ways do you keep the talent screaming? Well, first of all, I think it gets easier in, in music and maybe in any career that you do as you get older because you are freed from that kind of like young person's, um, I don't wanna say hunger, hunger is a good thing, but a young person's kind of like ego-driven hunger for recognition. And I mean, I still wanna be recognized now, but I think when you're first starting out, you're wondering if you're gonna be like a prodigy or a, a sort of like, um, I don't know, that you're just gonna get this kind of, our, our culture definitely has a sort of like fetishy place for young people in their field doing amazing things. And it's kind of beautiful to outgrow that. I also think I've come more into this feeling that, I, th I really think that everybody is talented. I mean, maybe that's, that should be an uncontroversial thing to say. Everybody is talented. And I don't, I think it is a kind of like capitalistic way of thinking that makes us feel like we have to prove ourselves to be more talented than everyone else. I think we would really benefit from kind of like a more, a more collectivist attitude in general. And I don't think that that means like, you know, people have like doomy visions of like, Soviet sameness or something. And that, I don't think that's the only way to have a collective mentality. I think in a world where we all feel that everyone is 
is important and has something to contribute, that doesn't mean that every contribution is meaningless. You know, there, it's just that we all have meaningful contributions to make. And I think, for example, everyone is musical. I think that's like a human characteristic. Everyone is artistic. And I, I don't think that I need to be special in order to get meaning out of making music. I'm just another person making music, and I think that's wonderful. Yeah, I, I think that's, uh, as a person who works with uh, students a lot, for example, or um, even in like the small business I run, like hiring people that are, tend to be younger than me who are using, who are trying to find a, a, a way, I think the thing that saddens me the most about something I, I just could not understand when I was in my early 20s especially, or late teens, is, um, is that just finding something that you like, feeling like letting yourself feel enough to like things and then focusing on those because it's okay to. I mean, like I think for you and for me too, it was music happened to be that thing. And then music happens to be a thing that everybody likes. I remember being some, some border crossing in Europe on tour once that seemed like it was gonna be a, a problem and our tour manager saying, just tell me you're musicians. Everybody likes music. Like they're gonna wanna know what it's like to be a musician. You're, and they're gonna wanna know what it's like to play in front of people and you're gonna be fine. Like we're all worried for some reason because we don't have to do that in the States or whatever. And he was totally right. Like as soon as, as, soon as we said we were in a, a rock band, they wanted to know more. They asked <laughs> us what it was like. And so we, I feel lucky that that was the thing I fell into because people like it, but like helping drive that drive to feel good about things that you do is, is, is super imperative. And we, I mean, we use it through the lens of music because that's something that is universal. Um, but, uh, I, the song you just played just struck that chord of, of aging. I've been thinking about it a lot. Like we get older and we just practice being alive more. It's not like we're smarter. Yeah. We just have like the experiences to be like, not to be pedantic with, with people who need to know, but to remind people like, no, you're fine. You're, it's cool. Like do the thing you like. If you're not good at it, that's fine too. You totally. will either get good at it because you like it or you'll stop doing it and find the thing that you like. You'll have, I think you'll have a kind of goodness at anything you like doing. It might not be the way that people evaluate whatever that skill is. You know, that it might not be the objective evaluation system that we use, but it's good to try to think outside of those anyway. Yeah, when I was in college, I was just, I mean, I was still in the same mindset I was when I was like six years old, which is like, somebody tell me I did a good job, and that's no way to live. Like, all you college students are out here, if you're still living that way, <laughs> try to get outside of it if you can. It took me a really long time. I was a very advanced student and a very, um, unadvanced human being. And I think that's really common, especially on college campuses. <laughs> I agree. And I think that um, uh, that's, I think, a big, maybe an issue for a lot of people who were advanced students in high school moving into, into college where they were just praised for grades and, and they were on time and they were polite in class. And like, you get the right kind of professors and the right kind of colleagues at a university who are more into the idea of the gray area, of mm -hmm. being in a place to learn how to learn. Um, which is very much, I, I feel like maybe, and I don't know if you share this or not, but I, I learned when I started touring that I was just constantly learning how to learn. I mean, I knew how to play music. Once I got on stage, that was the easy part. Everything else, the 99% of the day that is not playing was such an eye-opening adult experience for me, you know? Like we were talking about earlier, why do I know so much about fuel lines in vans now? Yeah. Because yeah. I have to now, yeah. because that's something that we needed to have to tour. And it was just, it was, it was, you were inundated with it. So like, um, and, and college set me up for that because I learned how to learn, I think a little bit better, but I did not know how to do that when I moved into it at all. No, and also interpersonally, like, I think being in a band is, will make you feel like the dumbest version of yourself sometimes, but it's also a great experience. It's like, it's like owning a business and a creative endeavor with your sibling who's also your spouse. Like that's the type of relationship it is with a band. You're with them all the time and your livelihood is tied up together and you're trying to bear your souls to each other and you're trying to like love and support each other. It's so much. And like when, now I've been, I, I'm not sure if you were in your band for years and years and years, I think you were. Yeah. Now I've been with these guys since we were like 19 and we're all in our early 30s now, and it seems like we're gonna keep on doing it. I mean, it's been, we've seen each other sort of become adults, and 
it, there were some really, really like embarrassing fights. Like if we had a tape recorder in the van, we would be our everyone who heard it would be aghast at the kind of things we would get hung up on. But it was a really good experience for me, and I think um, traveling together is a great is like a beautiful thing and very challenging and. Yeah, keeping up with your van, trying to do your own books, trying to like book shows when you're 19 years old and get venues not to like think that you're a kid they can take advantage of and trying to be tough. Trying to, I mean, I'm the only woman in the band trying to like represent myself in a way I feel good about. That's an endless struggle and it's been a really uh, tough experience, but a good experience too. Are you the only person with a solo active solo career in in Mipso or is every or, you know no, does... they all kind of have stuff going on yeah they everybody has it to a, to varying degrees we tour so much that it's hard you don't really get a lot of time to like put effort into your solo music but everybody is trying to do it so we have some some sense of being like independent human beings what is your tour schedule like these days since since uh, <laughs> I was gonna say since COVID since um, since things sort of reopened arbitrarily, um, we are on the road basically as much as we were before COVID, which is maybe like 150 days a year, something like that. And that's down from like at the height of our touring when we were just merciless toward ourselves. We were gone like 220, 230 days a year, something like that. What do you still like about touring? And that's a, that's a terrible question. I always loved touring even when it was hard. Like, what, do yeah. you, what gets you excited about touring? This last tour, we did, we've done a lot of the drives a million times, the same drive. Like, we've done the same stretches of 95, just endless dozens of times. But this last tour, we happened to have a show in Davenport, Iowa, and then the next day, a show in Winona, Minnesota, which is a little town on the Mississippi. And for the first time ever, we got to do a drive that was just right along the Mississippi for like three or four hours. And I realized I've never seen this before in my life. And it, the US is so huge, and we tour Europe too, but mostly in the US. The US is so huge and so varied and wild that I never get tired of seeing new parts of it. And even when we go back to the same old parts, things have changed and it's sometimes it's really depressing to see how like the same exact architectural style of um, overpriced condo is going up in every city, every mid-sized city in America. So there's sad things about it, but there's also like beautiful revelations. I love going to like crappy coffee shops in some little town that like they burn their espresso, but like everyone who's in there is a regular and they all love each other and they have some like special form of wet burrito that they make. I don't know. There's just like all, all across America, there are constant tiny revelations to be had. Um, there is something to be said about the, the wettest wraps in America are served to bands. <laughs> like if you're if you if you're a vegetarian and you're in a band, yeah. you're gonna eat the wettest food <laughs> it's possible. So true. Yeah. And like I think touring life has gotten way better for vegetarians over the last ten years. Cause I talked to people from a while ago about being vegetarian on the road and they're like, I ate a can of beans. <laughs> like that was my dinner every day. Yeah, we would take uh, we were vegan on one of my first nationwide tours where what you were just describing filled me with such um, excite excitement about um, just the geographical diversity of this beautiful country yeah. and how if you have, if, if it's one of your first tours and you're <clears throat> in a, like a politically motivated punk band, yeah. uh, when you're, <laughs> you know, you're driving 18 hours a day to get to your next show where no one will be and you see desert and snow and, and valleys and caverns all in one day, but we were all vegan. So it was all, I, I will always hail Taco Bell as the thing that kept us yeah. alive for two years. Definitely go Taco De Bell. Definitely an American icon for touring bands. But yeah, it's fun to see. Like, I think the drive is always like is is absolutely part of why touring is fun. Seeing what you get to for see. Sure. For uh, sure. Because bars all look the same. Yeah. It's, I mean, uh, audiences vary, mm -hmm. and it's awesome to play music, but getting there is truly beautiful. And actually that's one thing that makes it great to not be a super successful musician because once you graduate to being in a bus, you don't see anything because you drive at night all the time. And then also you only play in big cities. Like you don't play Davenport, Iowa anymore once you're selling out like 2,000 person rooms. You'll never go back to like most of the center of the country again. 
So I am, I try to be really appreciative of that. Like, yes, it comes with a like lower pay grade, but I get to experience so much, and it's much less anonymous. When and and we have to sell our own merch, and we have to like not we have to we get to interact with the people who just saw the show and hear what they thought of it and stuff. And it's it it is. It is very difficult, and I don't. I I sort of bristle when people say, "Oh, that must be fun," because I think they really underestimate how grueling it is. But it's also such a gift. Um, I'm, I'm going to do this real quick. Cool. We're we're running out of time, uh, and I'm only saying that because it's recorded right now. We could do this all day, and I'm really excited to have been talking to you about this. Um, uh, but I, I just feel. First of all, to address the bus issue real quick, one day I'm gonna write, I wanna get together with people who share that same sentiment about like, bus tours were the absolute worst tours I was ever on. I've never felt worse in my life. I've never felt more like a number. Mm. You know, like all yeah. of the, but then again, plenty of people do it and it's great and like, but yes, touring is hard. Touring is fun to talk about. Touring is exciting. Music itself is great. Um, my concern was when I gave up classical music, um, was that, uh, that I wouldn't have anything to hold on to. And I realized when like bus tours began that maybe that was more like it was, what it was like to be a classical musician. Like you were clocking in and out. You were going to the same places all the time. You weren't interacting with people. You were there not feeling what it's like to connect with people artistically. And I say that for two reasons. One, I say it because I feel like I failed when I gave up classical music in a way. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't even try. And so I hope that the bad feelings that I have that I attributed to that in my musical career um, were actually real. I don't believe they were. I believe classical musicians probably have a great time doing what they're doing. <laughs> um, but secondly, like, uh, just embracing the idea of freedom of movement, like the, the, the privilege of being able to go places and do a thing in front of people and the guts it takes to do it. And the guts it takes to like, m like, I'm, like I'm super like, inspired by the fact that you have, you know, we grew up a couple of times in life, and that second time is between 18 and 30, right? Like when you really get to see people blossom, you're still friends with those people who you got to do that with. You mm -hmm. still play music with them. And um, you get to do it in a way uh, that takes guts, where you have to remind each other that if there are two people in the room, it's still worth it. Mm -hmm. um, I think people who can, people who continue to do that in any realm, truly, are the ones who end up feeling successful. Whether they're making the money or not, the feeling of it really takes it a lot further. So I hope that you feel that way because you're doing amazing stuff. Um, before you play one final song, if you're okay with that, before, and can you tell us all about all of the things you're doing and how we can listen to them <laughs> as people uh, who may or may not have the internet, who may or may not go to our local record store, or who also like to go out and patronize local music? Yes. Well, my main gig is with this band, Mipso, and we play locally. We play in North Carolina at least a handful of times a year, and we have all our music up on all the online places and in most of the local record stores as well. Um, my name is Libby Rodenbow, and I release music under my own name, too, and that's also available in those places. And if you can't find it somewhere, please send me an email or a DM or something, and I'll happily mail you a record or CD of your choosing. Um, and then I play with a lot of folks around town, and if, hey, if you're a musician around town and you're looking for a violin player or a backup singer or whatever, I'm available. I love playing with other people. I love pe learning other people's music. And like you're saying, I think like the social aspect of playing music is one of the you know, most beautiful parts of it. So yeah, hit me up. I'd love, I'd love to play music with you, whoever you are. Can you, um, you're, by the way, the, the solo record that I think you put out, was it last year or two years ago? I can't remember. A couple, yeah, 2020. A amazing record. Um, Thank you. Uh, is the next record also going to be on Sleepy Cat too? I don't know. I'm sending it, I, I, it might be. I'm, Sleepy Cat is a great, an amazing local label that a couple of my friends run. I'm sending it out, my, my finished second record, I'm sending it out to some other labels in case they want to give me some money. Because Sleepy yes. Cat doesn't have any money, which is... Not really what it's about anyway, but if somebody can give you a little money, then maybe you get to like print more records or something. So um, I'm sending it out to some other labels, but you know, almost nobody has any money these days anyway. So uh, it, there's a good chance it'll be out with Sleepy Cat, and I'm hoping to put it out uh, this spring, but who knows? Excellent. It's ambitious. Well, in the meantime, uh, I uh, 
I encourage, if you haven't seen Libby play live with any, with uh, either as a solo artist or in Mipso, um, if you haven't listened to any of the records, please make a point to do it. Um, she's one of my favorite musicians. I feel lucky that she answers the phone when I ask her if she wants to do things like podcasts. Um, we appreciate you being here today at the inaugural recording of State of Sound Stories in the corner. Thanks to everybody. Thanks especially to Libby Rodenbow. Uh, Libby, will you play us home? I will. Um, this is a, a song that's a little, a little bit inspired by In Tall Buildings by John Hartford, which is a really great song if you haven't heard it. Go check that one out. And this one is called Sleeping Hard. Up in the buildings where the windows shine They're making money out of wasted time But in the long run They come up empty That's what I'm saying to my tired head Safe from the buzzards in our perfect bed, but it can hold us only so long. So I'm sleeping hard tonight, and I'm hoping that the sun won't be too bright. In to be the star think of all the Romeos down at the bar and when they go home they close the curtains and they are sleeping hard tonight and they're hoping that the sun won't be too bright in their eyes Ooh. So you're limping on across the plains manifesting yards in the future football games and you can feel it already thinning but there's a bounty on the western shore you're a little hazy on just who it's for but you've come so far and the clock is running and aren't we sleeping hard tonight Aren't we hoping that the sun won't be too bright? I know I'm sleeping hard tonight. And I'm hoping that the sun won't be too bright in my eyes. Ooh. Thank you, everybody. Libby Rodenbow, State of Sound Stories. We'll see you next time at the corner. You can call me names. You can say that I am stuck in my ways. 
You can see what you want, that's your prerogative.